Uh, Your Honours, uh, my name is Eugene Wallach. I'm here to represent uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation and Professor Aaron Kaplan. Professor Kaplan is uh, one of the leading scholars of the First Amendment and uh, a restraining order law. Uh, the order in this case uh, uh, required the removal of a great deal of uh, information that is, would be quite clearly constitutionally protected. Uh, we actually agree uh, with appellant that uh, none of the statements here would satisfy the requirements of the true threats exception for the First Amendment. But in any event, even if some might have, this order is not limited to such speech. It includes essentially all speech about Ms. Ellis. And as we understand it, uh, uh, it would also require continued removal by Mr. Chan of such speech. That, we think, violates the First Amendment. It is also inconsistent with a federal uh, 47 U.S.C. Section 230 statute, uh, which provides that basically that a person may not be, that a website operator may not be held liable uh, for speech of uh, uh, others who post uh, on on that site. Um, now, to be sure, uh, Ms. Ellis uh, uh, is uh, what the law would sometimes refer to as a private figure for liable law purposes. Uh, but uh, the, this is not the first case in which people have uh, harshly criticized uh, uh, people who are engaged, uh, otherwise private people who are seen as being engaged in uh, uh, what they, what the critics think is unethical behavior, uh, and uh, have uh, often tried to uh, essentially expose this behavior and uh, bring social pressure to bear on the people. Um, the leading case on this from the US Supreme Court is Organization for Better Austin versus Keefe. Uh, there is here, there was behavior uh, on the part of some party that was probably legal. There was a real estate agent who was engaging in particular kinds of real estate practices. And some people thought that he was behaving unethically. So what they did is they uh, repeatedly leafleted near where the agent lived and went to church, demanded that he change his practices, and indeed two of the leaflets requested recipients to call respondent at his home phone number. So they actually revealed his home phone number, something that did not happen uh, in, in this case. Um, and uh, the court enjoined this leafleting, and in part it enjoined it on what it saw as an invasion of privacy rationale, that is to say the trial court. Uh, and the US Supreme Court reversed. The US Supreme Court concluded that no, uh, that even if one views this kind of behavior as intrusive in a person's privacy, uh, that is not justification for an injunction against what would otherwise be constitutionally protected speech. Uh, something similar happened in the NAACP v. Claiborne Hardware Company case. Uh, uh, that involved a civil rights boycott of white-owned stores, but in particular, that boycott uh, demanded uh, that all African-American um, uh, citizens of Claiborne County, Mississippi, uh, would uh, participate in the boycott. Uh, and if people didn't participate, their names were taken down by store watchers. Their names were in red in the local church. There were statements made in speeches uh, uh, that uh, had a menacing component even that said that uh, necks might be broken if people don't comply with the boycott. The sheriff can't sleep with boycott violators at night. Um, and in fact, there, were, there was a smattering of actual violent incidents against people who didn't comply with the boycott. Again, something that was, uh, that's much more than is present here where there was no actual violent incidents. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court reversed both an injunction and a damages verdict in that case, precisely because people have the right to speak out even when that speech uh, is an attempt to try to, uh, to pressure somebody through the threat of social, uh, social ostracism, through the threat of revealing information about them, publicly known information, such as they're shopping in a store, and, but information that people would rather not see revealed. Uh, so those are just two, two of the most prominent cases. Uh, we think this case is very closely connected to that. Uh, the injunction uh, is extraordinarily broad, as we mentioned. It, uh, uh, it requires uh, uh, the, uh, Mr. Chan to remove all posts about Ms. Ellis. Uh, there, we see no basis uh, for, for, upholding, uh, for upholding an injunction of, of this particular breadth. I wanted to mention briefly the 47 U.S.C. Section 230 provision, but, Your Honors, uh, I would happily answer any questions you have about the First Amendment first. Counsel, the U.S. Supreme Court recently granted cert in the Alonis case where it's quite possible that they may refine or elaborate a bit on the test for true threats. It is conceivable that given this court's constitutional obligation to decide cases within two terms of court that we'll have to decide this case before we hear from the high court on aloneness. Do you have any thoughts about um, how this court might be able to work around that uncertainty as to how the aloneness case may come out? Yes, Your Honor. Um, the issue in the Alonis case uh, is whether to be a punishable true threat, it's enough that, a, that speech be um, uh, reasonably perceived as threatening, or whether there also has to be intended to be threatening. 
Under the statute at issue in this case, though, there already has to be a, a showing that the speech was intended to be perceived as, as uh, uh, threatening. Uh, so regardless of which way the Alonis case would comes out, the statute would only apply to speech that is intended to be uh, threatening and reasonably perceived as threatening. Now, under the Bose Corporation versus Consumers Union uh, case, uh, uh, in First Amendment cases, appellate courts uh, ought to exercise independent appellate review, at least as to judgments of application of law to fact, such as whether the statements are reasonably perceived as threatening. We think in this case, this independent appellate review would yield the result that these statements are not reasonably perceived as threatening. But again, even if you disagree and conclude that some of the statements could be reasonably perceived as threatening, regardless of how aloneness would comes out, all the other statements, the uh, many hundreds, I believe even a couple of thousand statements that were not cited as potentially threatening uh, would be constitutionally protected. Uh, Your Honors, the, the, the last item I wanted to mention is the 47 U.S.C. Section 230 uh, uh, statute. Uh, it it's, uh, simply provides that uh, uh, somebody who operates a website uh, not to be treated as a publisher of material uh, that is posted by others to that website. Uh, it has been read very broadly by, uh, by courts, uh, um, including, I believe, the Georgia Court of Appeals in one of the cases that we cite. Uh, it, is a, uh, uh, it is a case that, uh, excuse me, it is a statute that is specifically set up to make sure that if somebody runs a website, they're not going to be hailed into court, whether civil court or criminal court, we cite cases dealing with both, whether for damages or an injunction, we cite cases in part three of our brief dealing with both, uh, uh, because of speech that is posted by others. Why? Because Congress concluded that it didn't want to put people in a position where they had a legal duty to try to screen material, try to censor material uh, that is posted by third parties. So if indeed there are some things, and again, we believe there are not, but if there are some things that are threatening that are posted by third parties, the proper remedy there is an action uh, uh, against the actual author and not, uh, and not the, the operator of the, of the site. And I'm sorry, I'm, I, uh, I should mention one other case. Um, I'm sure this court uh, recalls well the Danforth v. Apple case, which involved uh, a, a, um, a statute uh, uh, that dealt with workplace violence restraining orders. And in that case, even though the court found there was enough basis there for a workplace violence restraining order, it specifically vacated the injunction and remanded the case to the trial court for entry of an injunction that was really limited to this kind of, uh, uh, to, to the threatening material. So this court has already recognized that even if there is some basis for a narrow injunction uh, that does not authorize an injunction of more material than that which is found to be reasonably threatening. Your Honor, if you don't have further questions, I would like to reserve time for my co-counsel's rebuttal. 